to call the order the committee of the whole meeting of Monday, July 20th, 2020. Do we have roll call, please? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Trustee Carroll. Here. Trustee Curtis. Here. Trustee Gaffino. Here. Trustee Gately. Here. Trustee Lowry. Here. Trustee Martinez. Here. And Trustee Berman. I'm oh, sorry, Mayor Berman. Thank you. Thank you. I am here. I'm a poor substitute for Lori. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I guess uh, audience comments, trustee comments, discussion. Our fir first item is uh, Gerald Ford incentive. Uh, Mike, Steve. I'll take that. All right. Uh, for those of you probably already know that the Gerald Auto Group operates all but one of the um, dealerships in the North Aurora Auto Mall. They purchased the uh, former Fox Valley Ford dealership in 2018, and it's rightfully named uh, Gerald Ford now. Um, they're looking to do some major renovations to the facility to the tune of $1.8 million. They're looking to minor, modernize the facility, enhance the customer service experience, um, and all to underlying to drive sales uh, in the location. Um, they are, Gerald Group is here to speak tonight, and I'll let them go through some of the specifics, but before they do, I just kind of want to remind the board that a similar request was made before the Committee of the Whole on May 15, 2007, where the Gerald Group came through and actually discussed a expansion of the Hyundai facility at that time using this incremental sales uh, pr approach to um, help facilitate the development at that time. It was going to help facilitate the um, actual expansion of the auto service center and helping to drive employment in the site as well. Um, that project did not did not go forward, and uh, obviously, rightfully, the uh, incentive itself did not go forward. Um, but after that discussion, it was deemed that the board was similar was comfortable with the the concept of that incremental sales approach at that time. What they're looking to do now is they're requesting, as you can see on this chart here, they're requesting nine hundred thousand dollars over the course of a ten year period, uh, capturing the incremental sales uh, generated with the enhanced facility. Um, and then what the underlying numbers will also dictate that that would also lead to an increase of over a million dollars. Um, so we're all here, Bill and I are here tonight. Uh, so is the Gerald Group. I'm gonna turn it over to the Gerald Group to kind of go through some of the specifics and we'll be here to answer any question that the board has. Uh, we're just looking for feedback at this time. If the board is comfortable with this and this approach, what we'd probably look to do would be to work with Gerald to draft a economic incentive agreement and then bring that back at a future cow for a future discussion. So right now, we just wanna make sure the board is comfortable with the concept of the numbers um, and how we arrived at this point. Um, there have been several meetings over the course of the last year um, on this project and staff is uh, comfortable with moving forward given the numbers that they're gonna be discussing tonight. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Doug Gerald and Don, John Dvorak of the Gerald Auto Group. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that introduction. And um, it's nice to meet all of you and see all of you uh, face to face, kind of. Um, it's uh, Village of North Aurora has been a wonderful partner for us in our family's business since um, we started the Nissan store there in 99, 2000. Um, at, Mike and I have had, you know, uh, have had several discussions and he's been a supporter of our organization the whole time and 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 uh, you all have been very supportive so i just want to just from 30,000 feet before we get into really opening up to any questions that you might have about the way that this spreadsheet is working and the proposal that we have in front of you today i just want to you know tell you that my strategy and our philosophy has not been to um you know, put proposals like this in front of you every time we reinvest in our business. And we've made a number of reinvestments that uh, have turned into additional sales tax uh, for the village and, um, and sales for us over the last few years. And the reason that we've got this one here in front of you is fundamentally because it can't, you know, it, it doesn't make sense for us to go forward without a partnership. Now in 2000 and 
14, or I think it was 16, actually, we um, relocated and reinvested in our Kia business uh, in North Aurora. And that same year, later that same year, we reinvested and relocated our Subaru business, both of which were, you know, substantial projects that, um, that, that worked out hopefully for, for the village um, and for, you know, and for us. Um, we've got what we have here in this Ford dealership was a, you know, um, a um, small size Ford dealership for a number of years. And we hope to, you know, with our acquisition um, in 2018 and the different peoples and processes that we plan to put in place here, we hope to grow it. But the facility itself is, is, has not had major investment since it was built in, you know, in, in 1999. So um, the data that we have that supports reinvestment in this facility indicates that there are a lot of Ford buyers in the area of responsibility that Ford has given us that have taken their sales business and hence their service business to neighboring Ford stores, um, not in North Aurora. So our <laughs> philosophy, the reason why we feel like facility investments appropriate at this time is to better serve the Ford customers that Ford has that are living in and around the village of North Aurora that this particular dealership is not serving. So um, there's opportunity in sales and that's the chief driver of the sales tax growth as you'll see. Um, however, the service department, it should be noted is, is far underperforming relative to our own internal benchmarks and Ford's benchmarks. And uh, today's service customers are tomorrow's sales customers. And so we feel like a total dealership overhaul that has has some increased capacity, albeit not much. The main, um, pretty much all of the money that we plan to invest in this facility will be to enhance the existing customer touch points in the car dealership. One of the changes that we made um, and that this facility will allow us to further enhance is that all of the Fox Valley Ford uh, clerical staff has been um, relocated off of this facility onto a, the former uh, Saturn, Bob Van Eyten Saturn facility at 204 Hanson Boulevard, which is a non-customer facing facility that we own in the auto mall. Um, and this facility will allow us to repurpose the old office space for expanded waiting room, expanded waiting capacity for our service customers. And we hope will drive um, increased loyalty and uh, ultimately sales tax to the village and to us for the long term. So all of, to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, John, my CFO, John Dvorak, is on the call as well, but uh, I'm sure the village and Michael will, will know this. All of the um, dealership properties that had, you know, are off their incentive programs that, you know, at one point they're on sales tax programs like this, and, and, and now they're, they're hopefully fruitfully uh, sending a lot of sales tax revenue to the village, um, no longer receiving, we're no longer receiving any sales tax rebates. And, and, and it's, a, it's a start that both benefited the village, I think, you know, and certainly our organization is, is part of the reason for our growth here. So I appreciate your consideration. I'm happy to kind of answer any questions that this report might create and uh, provide any color that, um, that might otherwise not be, not be evident by, um, the, the board and, and, and the mayor and, and everyone. So thanks for your time, everyone. I have, I do have a, a couple of questions for clarification. Sure. Uh, as I understand what the, pro, the, the, the um, agreement is, is this, that we will continue to receive approximately the same level of uh, sales tax that we have been receiving. Is that correct? Under the current sales volume, is that right? That's John, yeah, well, I'll, John, I'll let you answer that. I believe that you're correct, Trustee Lowry, but go ahead, John, why don't you answer that one directly? On, uh, on your screen, you should be able to see the 2017, 18, 19 village sales tax receipt. And we, just as a, a reminder, we purchased the dealership in September of 2018. Uh, helped to drive a little bit of incremental sales in the fourth quarter. You can see the increase of 162 to 176,000. 
had a very successful 2019 driving sales by about 48%. And even though those sales are uh, subpar compared to the other dealerships in, in the auto mall and other Ford dealerships, and that's where we see the opportunity, um, this year for 2020, I budgeted a slight decrease in, in total village sales tax receipts primarily due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, in April, well, March and April, we saw about a 17% decrease in sales, and the village saw about a 17% decrease in the related sales tax receipts. And I did my best working with um, input from our general manager, input from Mr. Hanna, in forecasting where the year would be. So we. I am estimating a slight drop, 235,000, and then we're using a base of that 290,500. Uh, and then if you look down below in the chart, um, essentially I am projecting that after construction in the first year, we're back to hitting that same $258,000 number in 2019 and ongoing substantial growth uh, subsequent to that. And so the village down below, you can see retains at in year one 225,000 and a growing amount thereafter, which is more than the village received in sales tax receipts in 2017, 2018, but a touch less than in 2019. Once this project's completed, the incremental village sales tax receipts will be dramatically higher, uh, some more than $100,000 a year higher. So this is a partnership where we're asking for 85% of the incremental uh, sales tax receipts. In other words, excuse me, but in other words, what you mean by incremental is um, those taxes generated by the increase in sales in the future? Is that what you mean? Correct. That in excess of $219,500 a year. Right, right, I got that, right, right, yeah. Thank you, I have no problem with the idea. Um, Mark Gately here. So uh, I, I really understand your reasoning and rationale. I do believe that curb appeal uh, does bring in customers and I like you expanding the showroom and creating some extra uh, space for um, sales. So I, I, I think it's a great idea and I think we should go ahead with it. Um, this is um, Tal Martinez. I got a question for you. Um, if um, this passes through and uh, we're able to help you as the village. Um, would this agreement will roll into your customers in any way? Would you know? Would, would they be able to benefit off uh, this break or agreement for them, for themselves? Mm -hmm. Indirect benefit would be the only benefit for the consumer. Our our organization would use the tax rebate to justify the $1.8 million expense that we would incur up front. And the customers would benefit through, hopefully, an experience that um, brings them back to our dealership, purchasing more Ford trucks and getting more oil changes. Okay. Yeah, I, I just, I know it's been a tough time for all those car dealers and uh, uh, the car industry at whole. So, uh, I am in favor, although uh, I'm 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 in for Dodge. <laughs> but uh, thank you, guys. I have a real concern with the fact that we seem to be um, having a growing affinity to subsidizing businesses in our village, and I, I you know it just seems like it's becoming less and less infrequent. Um, and, and I don't know that this is something that, you know, I mean, that's just part of doing business is you need to change, you need to evolve, you need to meet your customers' needs. And I just don't see that why the village needs to be subsidizing that, especially when we, you know, we've subsidized this auto mall since its inception. Um, and it should be at the point now where it should have been at the, at, the, at, the, at the growth trajectory of being able to budget for improvements. So I, I just don't know that we should keep giving handouts to businesses in the community when, I mean, there is a cost of doing business that's, that's inherent in any business. Trustee Curtis, I completely respect and, and understand where you're coming from. And 
all I can say is, is that in any business, there's a point at which it doesn't make sense to reinvest. And, you know, and, and, and I would hope that the village would look at the, you know, the location of the auto mall and the, in, in, in the success of the auto mall, they look at it with pride and they look at it with, you know, with, you know, recognizing that it supports, it delivers. I mean, I don't by any stretch of the imagination try to pretend that I'm, you know, saving lives or, you know, or, or a public servant in any way we, you know, as is evidenced by our actions in the past, we do and will continue to invest in our auto mall, in our business to drive sales for the benefit of all the stakeholders in our organization, including customers and employees. Um, as we've demonstrated by the millions of dollars we poured into the Subaru dealership, the Kia dealership, the, um, the Hyundai dealership that drives tremendous amount of sales. This is a project that for us, uh, we'd love to do, but if now is not the right time, then, you know, then, 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 you know, then we can, you know, I mean, we, we have financial resources as well. And, and, you know, and I, and, and I'm not trying to spend the village's money by any stretch of the imagination or, or, um, you know, that's, that's the reason why we have a baseline. The baseline is larger than, you know, I believe any tax receipt that this location has provided, you know, going back a decade. Um, and, you know, and um, that's, yeah. So I, I understand, but I don't see it as a handout in any way. No, I don't either. I, I think what we need to do is look at the long-term benefit that after the 10 years, as the increase in the sales uh, continues that the village will then stand to make uh, 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 reap a, a tremendous advantage in terms of monetary. Now, Rachel, and, uh, does that mean yeah. we don't need to? We, does that mean we now need to subsidize every business in our village? I think it depends on the situation myself. But in this case, I think we. In this case, I think we should go ahead. It seems to me that we are having a lot of investment in a lot of businesses in our community. And I'm just not sure that that is our job as the village is to, to be investing so heavily in okay. so businesses through tax incentives. Um, we don't give our homeowners this. We don't give, you know, I mean, it's to the taxpayers this. I just, I think we really need to take a step back and maybe not, maybe it's not giving them everything they ask for. Maybe it's taking a step back and doing a measured approach. But I, I just think, you know, this is coming to the board quite frequently now from with the different businesses in our village. And it's almost becoming a private public partnership with, with our businesses. And I don't think that's where we want to be as a village. I, this is trustee Carol, uh, trustee Curtis. I, I, I totally respect where you're coming from. When I first saw this, I, I had to pause and take a second look, but here, I, I think that um, it, it is certainly within our right to encourage business and encourage growth of business within North Aurora. And not only that, uh, I, I, I would take it a step further. And if we are, subsidizing our businesses quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of competition for other villages that want these businesses. And Gerald has chosen to make North Aurora your home or their home and have continued to grow and invest in North Aurora, not only in the sales tax revenue or employment, but in their general goodwill with every uh, community organization in the village. Uh, has gone and received sponsorship from Gerald at some point or another. And um, I, I, I think that uh, we do take measured approaches at these when they come up. And, um, but I, I do think it's within our province to encourage growth. And we pride ourselves on being a business friendly community and business friendly is in one time when businesses are struggling and the economy is not good, if we can prop them up a little bit to, to make them stronger, it ultimately benefits uh, the taxpayers because the more viable businesses we have in the village, the less the property taxes will be. Um, so it, yes, we don't do it directly to uh, residential taxpayers, but they benefit from every business that comes into the village of North Aurora. 
Trustee I do Hill, agree though. with Trustee Carroll. I, I kind of see things the same way with Trustee Carroll. You know, it's like, yes, we're subsidizing some tax uh, incentive, but at the end of the day, at the long run, is is helping our uh, homeowners to perhaps retain those taxes at, at the point that they are, right? Trustee Gafino here. So I look at it as it is a partnership, you know, and I hear time and time again how our taxes are going up, and people want more services, you know, and, and the one thing that can keep them taxes down is sales tax. You know, we hear it all over and over again. So um, to me, I look at each, each of these requests as a uh, standalone request um, and, um, you know, look at their value. And, and to me, it's like I said, an investment. And, um, you know, they've been good, um, good neighbors. Gosh, Automall has been just excellent to our community as well as Woodman's. Woodman's is another one that we uh, invested in and, and this pays dividends alone, a place for residents to um, buy groceries. But, you know, buy, who, who loves buying a car locally? I bought cars over there for the last 20 years. How nice it is that one in town. And the money goes back into our, our funds to help uh, our community. So um, I don't consider it a handout. I consider it like sort of partnership and, and maybe not every business that comes uh, would be, a good fit for us to do that. But I think we look at them individually and, and kind of like said, Mark Carroll said, I mean, they are um, a good neighbor, you know, they're great in community. Um, I just think, um, you know, I don't have any problem with it. I think uh, the numbers fare well, we're going to get ours and then they get theirs and, and anything above that threshold, you know, they get it back and definitely that Ford def definitely needs an uplift. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm for it and happy they're in town. Yeah, one, no, one last thought I, I'd like to share is <laughs> if you just look at it in a simple kind of way, um, we cannot do this and our taxes would stay the same. Or we could do this and then have the potential for the taxes to go up even under the deal uh, as you look at the bottom line according to that, across that um, list of uh, prices you have there. So I, I think we should go ahead for it. And I, I do agree with uh, Trustee Cofino that uh, we are in a partnership with business and we want to produce and uh, encourage businesses to come to North Aurora. But that said, I also agree with Trustee Curtis that we don't want to do this for every single business and every single time. And I share her concerns with an in seemingly increasing number of times uh, special uh, requests like this have been made to the board. So, uh, but in this case, I'm completely convinced it would be nothing but a win-win for both uh, uh, Gerald Ford and uh, and the village. Uh, you know, we need to look at a little history. Obviously, when we first went into the uh, auto mall, that was a risk, huge risk. And yes, we were deep into it as a partner. It certainly has been worthwhile for us over the years, though. So I don't think any of us can say that it was a bad decision. It was a great decision. And we've reaped a uh, very good sales tax from it. Not only that, but we've, we've developed some good partnerships with the dealers that have been there and proud of having them in our community. And also being able to say that, you know, we have this great auto mall in North Aurora and come and buy a car, but there's other things in North Aurora. They might stop and have uh, dinner and everything else. So it's that same old story. I think we're very judicious in the way that we select the businesses that we support and become partners with. I think in this case, we're talking about 50% of, uh, of what uh, they plan on expending on the development. Right. Yeah. Uh, I guess, you know, I don't mind the 900,000. Uh, you know, you could question the rapidity of paying it back, but my feelings are that that 900,000 is going to be paid back before 10 years. And therefore, our, you know, we're going to reap more as uh, earlier than what, we, than what we anticipate. So that's my feeling. And I think it's been a great partnership. Gerald's done an outstanding job in the community, not just in North Aurora, but Tavia and Aurora. And I think we're proud to have them in our community. And I know every time we knock on their door, they uh, 
they open their pockets for us. So uh, I think it's a it's an opportunity for us to to a partnership and an op opportunity for us to show that we do want to grow and we do want to certainly keep those businesses that we have already and see them expand. So I hope that we uh, I hope we, uh, uh, can work with us in the future. What, what happens if the sales tax falls below the 219.5? Well, we, no we get whatever there is. Yeah, so the way it's structured now is that 219.5 is that baseline and they would take 85% of that. If it goes below that baseline, we would just receive our regular sales tax. So basically their, their reimbursement is predicated upon their performance and their ability to increase their sales volume. It's above that 200 and, yeah, 218.5. Well, I certainly don't wanna see more vacancies in that location and I am in favor of partnering with them. Um, Bill, how do you, how do you think the, uh, the numbers are gonna impact our capital fund, our road funds? Do you think this is gonna be a significant, have a significant impact on our budgeting? Uh, no, because I think we've taken the base concept of retaining 100% of we, what we've been uh, getting and reasonably anticipating and so you're really just getting a small portion of the future sales tax dollars that are going to be generated as a result of the improvements. Um, so if anything, there's going to be a, um, if it goes according to, to plan in some form, shape, um, there'll be probably incrementally better uh, sales tax numbers for the general fund. And then once it's paid off, you'll have a, uh, as with other sales tax agreements, you'll have a larger amount um, at the end of it. So. <clears throat> um, this is kind of a model that's been uh, talked back and forth a little bit for a few years, and I think um, you know it. It kind of fits. Um, it fits our needs, and I think it fits uh, Gerald's needs as well. And it kind of puts the onus on them to increase the sales above that base volume, as they mentioned. Thanks, Bill. You're welcome. I'll add this uh, team that uh, when when a, a company comes in and does uh, remodel work or repair work or makes improvements to their building, that does spark more uh, development and um, improvements for our community. And I like the idea of of that because I do believe that it'll add enhance that whole area there. So I, I'm really uh, I like to see us go through with this program. I like the increasement in the number of employees also. Yes. That's really important to our community. So all right, good. I think our discussion has been good. I think we've, uh, the staff has done an outstanding job of working with, uh, with the uh, Gerald people and coming up with this. And I think that, uh, I think it could have a great deal of success in the future. And thank you for the presentation and thank you for, uh, for everything you've done. Thank you for all your input. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, thanks to the entire council and, and um, no matter how this project turns out, our, our organization and, and extended stakeholders have um, just been really proud and thrilled to, to be a part of the North Aurora community and continue to work and uh, sell cars and fix cars in, in our community. And uh, it's been a wonderful partnership for us. And um, I just want to thank everyone on this call. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Item number two on our uh, discussion this evening. Uh, that would be Mr. Tote. Mr. Bosco, are you going to take that? or is it No, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that. All right. Um, yeah, I think this, the last item for discussion tonight is to sort of pick up on the uh, mobile food vendor provisions. Um, the Village Board discussed this on June 15th at the Committee of the Whole meeting. Staff came prepared with an ordinance of approval at the last board meeting uh, and the item was actually just tabled based upon some of the discussion that came up during audience comments. Um, and, and you'll see here too, there's been a little bit of addition, not only to the mobile food vendor provisions, but also to, in addition to the special event permit um, information as well. Um, the main crux of why we came forward in the beginning of June was just to sort of update our code. Steve alluded earlier in the discussion 
um, that trailers were not included as part of the definition. And, you know, we've been seeing an uptick in these in, in the use of that, not really just in North Aurora, but all over the uh, all over the country for that matter. So what we had done was updated the definition of mobile food better to include trailers. Um, so the, the, the definition, which you see in the language um, in the packet tonight, um, is a result of discussion with the village attorney and staff. And um, per that June 15th, the whole discussion, the board was comfortable with the definition adding trailers. So that really hasn't changed other than some of the specific verbiage. Um, we also brought forward language that um, discussed the prohibition of uh, sales of food items on main roads. And on June 15th, the village board um, was okay with the, you know, all the main roads that we had listed specifically. And um, I think it was Trustee Lowry that brought up uh, Banbury Road. So uh, Banbury Road has been added to the actual list of roads that the uh, mobile food sales will be prohibited on. Uh, so you'll see that in the draft language as well. Now, when I speak to the draft language in the packet, you'll see some strike throughs and underlines. Basically what I had done was, it, just took the original language that was you know, form, originally adopted in 2016, and then just, this is where we're at with everything right now. So um, old language meets new language in the packet as well. And also too with the um, special event permits, because if we're gonna include information in the mobile food vendor provisions, we also wanna mirror that information in the special event permits. Um, the one, item that was sort of the point of contention of the last discussion was the hours of serving time. Uh, as we've already discussed multiple times tonight, the limit is two hours, whether you're on private property or on public property. Uh, what staff proposed originally was allowing up to four hours of sale on private property, um, and actually just four hours of sale in general is for, for mobile food vendors. And then what we had come up with between then was parsing it out between four hours for private, pr private property and then two hours on public property. And that's what we still have in the language in front of us today. Um, at that time though, the board had just uh, voiced their concerns about you know, multiple, multiple food trucks coming on multiple days at the same property. So what we had done was added some language that would prevent some from coming on, on private property more than once in a week. Um, so those are some important notes to add for tonight's discussion. It's while well, you have the mobile food vendor information in front of you. It's, it's actually a little easier to kind of take a look at the special event language because it, it outlines it very simply. Um, any, any mobile food vendor, if you're going to have more than one mobile food vendor in a day, you're required to get a special event permit. If you have one, more than one mobile food vendor at a time, meaning two on one property, you're, you're required to get a special event permit. Um, if there is more than two hours serving time on public property, let's just say that you have a birthday party or a graduation party, um, you would be required to get a special event permit. And also for private property, um, anything in excess over four hours would require a special event permit. So the times would go from two hours blanketed time for any location in the village to now two hours on public property limitation, otherwise special event or four hours on private property, otherwise special event. And then you cannot have more than one mobile food vendor at a time on a property. And uh, you cannot have more than one in a day without getting a special event permit. Um, so that sort of summarizes everything that where we're at. Just wanna open up to the board for questions, comments, and just see where you're at. You know, I have a question that came up in the last discussion, and that is the playing of music. Uh, isn't that in uh, this ordinance that they're not allowed to play music, the food truck? Yeah, so that, that is actually not in the, that's not in the actual mobile food vendor provisions. It's actually in the special event uh, provisions that say that, you know, Sunday through Thursday, you, if you have application before 10 a.m. or after 9 p.m., special event. Uh, Friday, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., outside of those times for amplification of sound, we'd be required to get a special event permit. All right, so it doesn't apply to food trucks specifically? Huh? No, no. And it hasn't been really, there's never, there's not been a problem to that effect, but sometimes, you know, you, you kind of have to lump them all in. You might have an ice cream truck, that's a mobile food vendor. Someone selling barbecue from a trailer is a mobile food vendor. Um, a roach coach or a taco truck, those are all sort of lumped in one category as mobile food vendors. Uh, if I could say one thing, the reason that they, 
private time, uh, went to four hours and public stayed at two, was for the most part, any event that's on public property is gonna require a special event anyways, because if they're actually using village property, they have to get a special event permit uh, regardless. By keeping it two hours on public, you're just basically saying that no one can park on a street for more than two hours, which we thought was reasonable. But by making private four hours, you're giving options for local businesses if they wanna have a food truck once in a while for you know a reason for their customers, or more likely is, uh, residents who actually hire food trucks or trailers for private parties at their homes. Now they can come to their house for four hours and, and that's acceptable without having to go to the board to get approval to hire a truck to come to their house. Well, can, can't we make a distinction in the code between mobile food sales and mobile food catering that would uh, eliminate that uh, need for if you allowed mobile food catering at a private residence for four hours, I don't think anybody's got an objection to that. But if it, you're on private property for more than two hours, I think you can, it, it's selling food. I think you can make that distinction, can't you, in the code? Well, I think in that case, it'd be a matter of where they're selling. If they're on the street, it'd be two hours. If they pull in the driveway, it'd be private property at that point for four hours. Well, here, I'm against raising it to four hours. The, the, the reason we have the special, that we drafted the special permit application back in when we had this discussion a few years ago was to allow for the increase, exactly what Tanner Trails did today allow for the increase past two hours. So I don't see the need to change the code to go to four hours to allow for private property, especially given the current climate we are, where people can't even, uh, our, our current businesses, our, our existing businesses are struggling every day to get customers in the door. And here we are allowing, uh, food vendors without a permit to, to go anywhere they want in the village with few exceptions for four hours. I think that gives an unfair advantage. And, and it uh, uh, also, I, I don't see the need to, to change the code when we already have a provision for applying for a special use or a special permit application. So yeah. I'm not in favor of increasing to four hours on private property. I, I, I agree with Trustee Carroll. I think we should uh, separate that. I like the idea of calling catering at a house versus selling it at a church or gas station or wherever they're at. I think they're two different things. So if that's what we're looking to help or not help uh, allow on a, a birthday party to have the taco truck come, I think we should try to separate that in some kind of wordage. Okay, so, that, so I'm clear. That actually, I'm glad for the clarification because I think that was one of the hard parts for staff was how to um, not have residents calling with um, special event application permits at the last second when they have a party on a Saturday and all of a sudden on Thursday before a board meeting, they're having a party and they need a food truck license. So if I understand right, what we would do is simply put a line in that says that private residents, parties at private residences would be excluded from this rule. As long as they're not selling. Right, if they're taking the money, then that's public. different. Yeah. Selling to the general public. So they'd have to actually be hired by the private homeowner and, and only providing food for that specific party. Right, catering an event. Okay. Right. But would they be selling the food to the uh, par private party participants? No. Well, no, they, they would be catering it. Catering services and then, yeah, and then this is serving the food. Correct. Right. Really clears things up. You know, That's fine. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't take that. credit from that for that. That that idea came from the resident that objected last week, and and actually gave me the idea of the distinction between catering and sales. Well, that's great. I think that uh, that really clarifies it. But so that I make sure that we have this right, but that would only still apply to private residences, actual residence houses, not sure. businesses. Right. Okay. What, what if you had a business that wanted to cater a private party? And charge? 
outside. <laughs> no, he's talking about someone that just wanted to hire a food truck to cater uh, their uh, – that's a good point. I think the distinction should be not between private property and, and commercial property, but sales and catering. Well, if they're taking money in, right. If, if someone's just paying and they're giving away the food would, versus they're taking money in for each individual sale or request, that would be the difference, I would think. But if someone's taking an admission fee, I mean, I'm telling you, this, 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 this there's a multiple different rabbit holes you can go down with these sorts of things. So I just want to make sure that we kind of broach every one of them if, we, if we're going to go sure. that direction. Right. So I definitely like the residential side of it with the catering part. I think that's what this was driving the four hour on private property. So I think right there, it would eliminate a four hour event at the church or, you know, maybe they have private, to do a special, special request. A private party by definition isn't open to the public. So that could be part of the definition. I really do uh, agree with the catering provision over uh, outside sales also. Is that how they operate when they are hired by a, an individual to serve a party? Does the individual pay them a lump sum of money and then they just hand out the food to the participants? Or do the participants have to pay for the food as they go? I think that's a question of confusion for me. You no, could write Participants would come up to the truck and, and make their order, like if the, it was a taco truck, order their lunch. And then at the end of the event, the two hours, the, the property owner would settle up and pay the, the caterer, the food truck, whatever amount oh, incurred. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, so, we're, Go ahead, so we are comfortable with, with – um, residential districts and I know that was brought up by that same resident so I just want to make sure there was an issue at beginning about having them in um, residential neighborhoods so I just want to make get that clarified that same person spoke they talked about prohibiting in um, residential neighborhoods so I just want to make sure that we're on the same page well I, the, from what she said sent to me today she her concern was with the sales in residential neighborhoods she was not against like somebody uh, having a food truck for a birthday party. Okay. And, and, and a truck would have to step park on their property, not on right. the street. Right. I think that was really just that was the only thing Mike and I went back and forth um, several times on how to write the four hour provision. I think the caterers uh, role, that's something that we can easily work with Kevin if that's the only change. I mean, that, that's pretty easy to come up with language and bring it back to the board. Okay. That was good. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Carol. <laughs> yes, sir. You think we got it, huh? We'll give it another shot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I sure hope so. All right. Uh, we don't have a, uh, a meeting, do we? No. No, we don't. Entertain a motion to adjourn for the evening. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Good night, all. Great meeting. Aye. 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 Aye.